Welcome everyone tuning into this discussion on gold investment for one-to-one -one mining investment EMEA online autumn 2020. I'm delighted to be joined today by an auspicious panel of precious metals investors who have a pedigree in identifying and investing in quality gold mining companies. So introducing the panel, it's my pleasure to welcome John Wong, Portfolio Manager at Ruffer Funds, Florian Siegfried, Portfolio Manager at SSI Asset Management, Angelos Damascos, CEO of Sector Investment Managers, and Ian Williams, CEO of Charteris Treasury Portfolio Managers. Warm welcome, everyone. Uh, let's get started in this discussion. We're very interested to hear the beliefs of you as shareholders um, in the industry. How are you making sense of global markets at present in this uh, quite, quite turbulent year? Um, John, could I, could I come, come to you first with that question? Yes, thank you. Um, well, this is a, a difficult year in the sense that um, there's so many events that actually has happened over the year. So one can say that, yeah, everybody remembers and thinks of COVID, but that's just not the only event. Um, there are lots of things that have been brewing in the markets for a long time. Um, so for me, whether you look at things like interest rates, for me, is a big deal. Um, and interest rates have actually been uh, at least real rates have been going negative for a while, actually since 19. And that's when actually gold prices started to move. And COVID for me was just a trigger. Um, when COVID happened, it triggered a massive sell-off in global equities, a short sell-off in gold. But then from that point on, people thought the safety of uh, gold as safe haven. And that's what's taken us up to here. So... This year, as I look at it, I can see so many events, whether it's US elections, whether it's global economy, uh, whether it's vaccines, how we can recover. So these are the backdrop to the issues, uh, but I'm not sure if I've got all the answers. Yep. And do you think that um, the interest rate scenario is going to continue into next year, much as it has been, just because of the way that uh, global GDP, certainly in Western countries, is positioned? It feels like a tough place for interest rates to move up. Um, I, I mean, I never say never because that's one thing I learned. You know, if you ask me how this year is going to go, I would never predict it this year the way it goes as it has been. But I can't see many scenarios where interest rates can move up that quickly. Um, even if the vaccines were found and even if things start to normalize, it'll still take a little bit of time. Uh, I will be shocked if interest rates start to move up by next year. Yeah. Do you think with this backdrop, then the, the gold price has got further to run um, in the early part of next year? Or is it a case that Biden's come in, there's some sort of stability and or perceived stability, maybe, maybe gold sort of hit a plateau? Yeah, I think when I look at gold, it's really hard to predict gold because there are quite a number of things that, that uh, play in its favor. Sometimes people look at it as a safe haven. Sometimes they look at it as an alternative. Sometimes a dollar hedge, interest rates, and so on and so forth. So different things take a different, um, uh, dominate the gold scene at different times. Um, so for me, a lot of it is looking at the rate of change. Is anything changing very aggressively that drives gold? And I think the market short term is focused on the recovery and the vaccines. So if, if we have a stability in the economy, there is a chance that gold might trade sideways for a period of time. Um, so I think that's where we are. I think that's the battlefield. Uh, and I'm not sure in my mind if I know the answer at this stage. Yep, absolutely. Okay, good, good, mm. good introduction to that. Um, Florian, do you have uh, any further thoughts or what's your take on how um, markets have been over this, over this turbulent year? Yeah, I would agree to what uh, John said. Um, if I would put this whole COVID crisis into the bigger picture, um, sometimes I feel like uh, we are probably going into a new paradigm in a way that uh, since the global financial crisis, we um, have experienced uh, QE1, QE2, green shoots, a massive um, stimulus from a monetary standpoint, but what really happened is, you know, all the money was stuck in, in the base supply, never got spread out in the economy. 
And as a result, you get asset price inflation and a, a tremendous bond rally. And so now with COVID, um, my thinking is just, um, you know, the mechanics have changed to some degree because uh, now you have um, not just the central banks and the commercial banks creating that sort of money, but you have the politicians um, playing a key role because they are now guaranteeing, like here in Switzerland, for example, they are virtually guaranteeing all those loans. And now the money is being no longer stuck in the base money, it's going out in the broad money. And what I think is the reaction in the market, um, okay, eventually that was what everybody would have, would have expected 10 years ago, never happened, now it happens. As a response, um, we get these V-shaped um, hopes in the economy because now we get flushed with cash, rates are still low. On the other side, uh, you feel, okay, if this happens, it's going to be uh, inflationary. So gold is responding well to that environment, but also the base metal complex, copper, nickel, zinc, despite there is a, a very bleak economic picture, all these metals are up. And um, I think um, this is like, for me, the big question is, are we changing from a like 10 year or 30 year deflationary trend into something what would probably be more inflationary. So um, I can understand John's fears that it would be a nightmare uh, seeing rates go up, but I think in the longer term, there is no way to, to, to do something against it. So personally, I think um, rates are poised to go higher uh, and it's not going to end well. <laughs> Okay, interesting. Um, thank you. Um, Angelos, could I bring you in here and, uh, and get the view from sector investors um, and, and how, what do you think towards some of those points on rates and also gold price, whether that's got further to run early next year? Yes, uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, I agree that uh, the, the interest rate picture has been uh, very supportive of gold since late 2018, early 2019. And 2019 was the first, uh, in the middle of 2019, was when the, the gold price started breaking up from its five-year trading pattern and, and uh, going significantly higher. But I, I, we sincerely feel at this stage that uh, the COVID uh, impact, which was totally unexpected, has introduced uh, a paradigm shift, not only in the global economy and the way we live our lives, but also in, in the monetary scene. And uh, I draw a parallel to a person who becomes severely ill and is unable to work and for some reason has no income support. So one has to draw from one's uh, savings and reserves and uh, effectively deplete uh, one's net worth uh, until they get better and start recovering and, and start working again. It's something similar. The governments and the central banks have thrown huge amounts of cash to the economy but it is essentially to, to a large extent life support. So it is life support to maintain a certain amount of productive capacity so that we, the economy can recover quicker when we finally get to grips with the pandemic. So uh, the, the problem with that is that, uh, first of all, it is clear that we have lost uh, significant GDP uh, around the world and productive capacity, but uh, also that cash has uh, risen the debt levels at the public and private sector level exponentially. And all of that debt has to be serviced and paid back. We all know that it's a fact of life. So it's not gonna be easy for the economy even, even when it starts recovering from the dreadful situation of the pandemic to cope with this huge uh, debt level. And the result uh, ultimately is the debasement or devaluation of the all, most, most leading currencies around the world they will all lose value effectively as a basket. And this is what stimulates the so-called reflation trade, why people are now rushing into the industrial companies, into the stock market, in the hope that uh, they, they will maintain their value better in a recovering economy against uh, your know, paper cash, which is losing its value. Uh, so, I think, you know, I, I agree with uh, the comment that uh, base metal prices have risen a lot uh, significantly in the last uh, 
month or so, uh, but I think it, it's probably a short term recovery from a very low level. Uh, I question whether it is uh, sustainable. So whereas with gold, we have um, a situation where the central banks will be unable to raise interest rates uh, significantly because the global economy is ailing and because the debt level is humongous. And uh, they have stated publicly, at least the Federal Reserve, that they are willing to allow inflation to rise to the upper level of their expectation. So we will, we will likely continue to have negative real interest rates for a while. And that is uh, typically and, and historically supported for precious metals, particularly gold. So I think, you know, I, I'm quite uh, optimistic uh, that uh, next year will be again a very strong year for gold. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, one question I wanted to pick out of some of the things you said there is around, you know, this uh, reflation and the choice of people to turn to equities, perhaps over savings or cash. Um, this is quite—is uh, it—is it, is it quite unheard of that gold would be uh, so bullish, but also equities would be doing so well? U.S. global or global equities, for instance. Um, and do you, do you see equities petering out a little bit? Um, I'm talking about equities general here, not gold mining stocks, for instance. Um, do you see that that um, coming down a little bit, um, cooling off in, uh, as we go into next year? Or is it a case of it's just a, a quick V-shaped recovery based on a lot of confidence around um, the vaccine or, or the bounce after that drop in March? Well, I think the, the equity markets overall appear to be uh, a little bit overvalued and they are subject to a correction for whatever reason. Um, at the moment, there seems to be the so-called rotation trade. People move out of the, the internet technology stocks, et cetera, that were favored because uh, people saw them as a refuge uh, as a result of the COVID lockdowns and working from home situations, uh, now moving into industrials and, and previously unloved sectors. For example, the oil and gas sector has seen a, a remarkable resurgence. Uh, in terms of stock prices in the last couple of months, and so have the, the base metal uh, miners. So there is this sort of uh, rotational trade at the moment, but uh, I wonder whether it will be enough to sustain the equity indices at the all-time high levels, and uh, whether we're going to see a slight uh, sort of uh, decline, if, you know, uh, if not a correction uh, based on any exogenous uh, event. Okay, yeah, excellent. Um, I'll come on to that point around some of the rotational capital and in terms of whether it's looking at gold equities in a minute, that's where we want to lead to. But Ian, could I bring you in here on some of these macro um, factors that you're watching closely um, and where do you feel the gold price might be going next year? Okay, well, we've got a slightly different view uh, on uh, interest rates. Um, first of all, you've got to define what you mean by interest rates. If you just mean, you know, overnight money, then yeah, they're going to stay low for a while. Um, but we see uh, really severe yield curve steepening. I mean, we're in the Morgan Stanley cap that the 10 year Treasury bond is going to go straight through 1% to 1.5%, maybe even higher. Um, and we think that is on the back of um, massively rising inflation expectations. Um, inflation is a year on year phenomenon. And what you've got at the moment, you've got a lot of bond investors all saying, oh, there's no inflation, there's no inflation. Um, if you take March 2020, once that becomes the base for future inflation, you're looking at food inflation. All the food commodities are up at least 50%. Uh, UK house prices are going up 7, 8, 9, 10% a year. Um, there's inflation wherever you look. Um, and once, once we get through the next March and all these uh, price falls drop out of the index and you're looking at a base figure for oil of around $10. It's currently $40. That's four times where it was. So inflation is a year on year phenomenon. So you're going to, the big surprise we think is you're going to see some really big inflation numbers coming through. And we don't think these commodities have stopped going up either. We still think that there's further uh, big rises in food commodities further down the line because um, a lot of the, uh, agricultural supply has been disrupted by COVID. Same as these, a lot of these mining, base metal mines, that, that a lot of the mines in South America have closed down. So you've had increased demand coupled with the restrictions in supply. So we're very, very bearish on bonds. We think the bond market is in for major, major problems. And uh, although the uh, 
central banks may not put short rates up. They have no control whatsoever on term rates, 10-year bonds, 20-year bonds. And in the UK, you've got 50-year bonds. So, uh, you know, that is a place where you don't want to be. In terms of gold, um, gold is very expensive relative to other commodities. I mean, the gold oil ratio is, is at all time, when it, it was in March, when it went down to $10 a barrel, all time and ever high. But gold copper ratio is quite high. The gold silver ratio is still quite high. So gold is not, a, gold has had a big run up and a lot of these other commodities haven't really joined, joined in fully. So what we see is gold continuing to go up, but not, not very much. But all these other commodities start to catch up. And our favorite ones are silver and copper, actually. We think that's where the uh, biggest price gains are going to be if you want to trade metal, metal markets. So, um, Ian, I'm, I'm right in th- summarizing that you, you think there's a, a cyclical commodities boom period, or certainly for a lot of the base and, and, and the agri, and as you mentioned, it, coming, it, coming through. Everything, yeah, all commodities are going to go up. Yep, and gold's gold, been the gold. back. Gold's been the leading, so gold's been the first one to move. It's always first mover in a big bull market in commodities. It's had its yep. first move. So we think the next stage of the game is a lot of the others catch up. It doesn't mean gold goes down, it just means it doesn't, it stops, it goes up at a much slower rate than things like silver and copper and uh, even iron ore is going up at a rate of knots as well. So it's. Uh, yeah. Okay. Then, um, then, sorry, go on. And the move that you're seeing in some of these commodities like soybeans and uh, wheat and stuff. It's really sharp increase. I mean, coffee went up 7% in a day like a couple of days ago. You see some really big moves in, in agricultural commodities as well. And it's a kiss of death for the bond market. Okay, yeah, interesting. Um, let's move on then to uh, mining equities, gold mining companies. Um, and I wanted to focus on, um, you know, the appeal of the of gold miners right now to a broader investment base to the generalist perhaps um what's perhaps different about the health of gold mining companies this time versus the last cycle and will that lead to more generalists larger pension funds putting more capital in or is mining still a bit too um too risky or not sort of proven itself for a long enough period yet in do you, do you want to take that one first yeah we we think uh, that gold mining companies and the silver mining companies are making so much money at the moment that generalists, even Buffett started buying them. Uh, yeah. You know, the average gold miner has all in sustaining costs of, I don't know, eleven to twelve hundred dollars an ounce, and they're currently selling it for nineteen hundred dollars an ounce. These are huge profit margins. They're all spitting off loads of free cash flow. Some of these silver mines are even more profitable. So it, the profitability of the sector. Uh, it, it is something that is not fully reflected in investors worldwide waiting. Um, and if you look also in the base metals, uh, because in our equity fund, we, we, it's full of Rio Tinto Zinc, stocks like that. Those stocks have, have, have not only made, that's the only sector that have maintained and increased their dividends this year, is the metal miners. Um, all the others have either abolished their dividends or cut their dividends. And so, we run an equity income fund, and we our fund uh, has maintained its dividend this year. It has, like a lot of others in the sector, the dividends disappeared. We, we you know, because they all in banks and all in oil companies stuff. We didn't have any of this stuff. Um, so I think that the sheer profitability of the sector will draw generous money into it, um, and even if it's just a certain. The only difference is some of the, the average yield dividend yield on a gold mine is maybe one or two percent. The yield on these base metal miners is five, six, seven percent. You know, so it's, it's, if you want income, you're better off buying Rio Tinto or BHP Billiton than you are buying an average gold miner because you get much higher dividend yield. And potentially, as I said before, we think that, that you know there's potentially more upside in things like copper and one or two of the base metals than there is in gold at the moment. So, but the best the problem you have a lot when people look at this. Then they start saying, oh, well, it's you know, ESG, it's not an ESG particularly friendly investment. We say, well, hang on a second. You know, an electric car costs, takes four times as much copper to, use, to, 
wanted to build as a petrol car. You can't build any solar panels without silver. So it's all very well saying mining is not particularly ESG friendly, but without these metals, there is no uh, decarbonisation. It can't take place. So, you know, Do you think that's what's holding some of this capital back, though? Do you think the ESG element is what you said? You said that perhaps um, re- relative to value, um, generalists are underweight in mining. Um, relative to the value that the sector is presenting. Is it ESG that's holding that capital back? A lot of it is, yeah. And they look at it and they think, oh, this is an ESG-friendly sector, and they put off by buying it. But then others start taking a slightly different view, more and more, more alongside what we think. So, well, you've got to get these uh, copper and, and silver and stuff out of the ground, otherwise you can't, the decarbonisation can't take place. So, as I say, a lot of this... Uh, ESG uh, views on, on, on things are very subjective and you know, one yeah. man's ESG is another man's non-ESG but investors are being forced into the sector because it uh, in, in, in pursuit of higher dividends because it's one of the it's the only sector around that's increasing their dividends mm-hmm. okay great um jo- john can i switch over to you again um i want to talk about those uh, generalist perceptions that you you might be seeing or feeling of Gold. Um, do you do you feel that there's scope now um, for um, the gold mining industry um, to reach a broader base of investor, um, given how well companies have been performing of late? Yeah, I think <clears throat> to do that, I probably will take us back a little bit. So, if we look back in history, um, I think generalists have had a tough time investing in gold mining companies. So they tend to come in very, very late. Then they sit in there for the last spike. And then after that, the whole thing sells off and then they lose their shirt, right? And so so they've done that a few times and they kind of always think, well, this is a a mug's game really because they never quite, they're never there at the bottom. Um, They're usually there when it's coming towards its end end game. Um, And I think if they were serious investors as opposed to say speculators, they're probably asking themselves, how durable is this gold price? Like, is this going to be a flash in the pan? Is it going to be finished by next year? Or is this going to last for a long time? And I think the longer they believe the gold price holds, okay, that will be one factor that draws people in. So, for example, I think Buffett's probably had a change of view. He probably thinks before gold was pointless. But now he thinks, okay, maybe there is some value to gold okay, on a longer duration. So he can see, okay, over the next X years, this is a good point to get in. So that's why he has come in. I think other factors to think about is that, you know, uh, we, as a sector, I guess some of the management teams have not covered themselves in glory in history. You know, they buy buy companies at a bad price, you know, uh, overpay for things. And then you've got lots of uh, misallocated capital, all these kind of, uh, well, probably more on the um, uh, G side of ESG has been negative for, for generalists. They don't like that kind of stuff, you know, uh, whether it's executive pay and options and all these kinds of things have, have not really helped the generalists. They don't like this kind of stuff. Um, but I do think things have changed, you know, all the big companies, whether it's Barrick, Newmont, uh, they all have CEO changes in the last four or five years, you know, from 2014, 15, 16, 17, there are many main changes. Um, And you can see actually that uh, in terms of capital allocation, um, a lot of these companies are much more disciplined. I mean, look at Barrick. Okay, they introduced, well, I I wouldn't say they introduced, but they did reintroduce the concept of zero premium mergers, right? That didn't exist. Everybody is going to pay a 30, 40, 50, 60% premium and then get a wipeout uh, in terms of misallocation of capital at some point. But these kinds of things, I think, will give the generalist confidence that the management teams are not crazy. Okay. Uh, they're going to be responsible allocators of capital, started paying back dividends uh, already. Uh, they're generating lots of free cash flow. And if you look at on a Okay, I mean, I'm just stating one metric, free cash flow. If you compare it with pretty much most general companies out there on the S&P 500, they are earning way more than the rest of the guys. Okay, so at some point, um, that would tempt people to come back. But I think the question they'll have to have 
some confidence in is the durability of the gold price. Yep. Um, but yeah, with with what's going on globally, that could that could be um, for quite a long time. Let's hope so. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so good, good performance generally for, for for quite some time then, and that sustained performance can bring it back. Great. Yeah. Uh, Florian, could I? Do, do you have any comments on the mining companies' um, performance? Do you echo those thoughts um, in terms of how well they've been performing, and do you think? There's more. There's further for them to go in terms of any of these uh, ESG pillars to win back some of that generalist capital. Yeah, I think um, I would agree to what uh, John mentioned. Um, compared to the last cycle, um, we've seen gold moving up in like 2010, 2011, but we've seen the same escalation of costs. And usually, um, uh, you know, the generalists, they would not buy into a contrarian trend. They rather buy into something where they seem confident it's moving up. So I think they um, got burned the last time. And as a result, uh, they are really not getting back in a big way this time around. I mean, we see some uh, movements, but not really based on what we would or we expect when we would just regard the fundamentals, when you would, you know, assume the overall industry is producing at, let's say, all in sustaining costs of probably a thousand, then you want to add um, probably like $300 for non-sustaining uh, and tax. So it gives you like a 13, 1400 number, which would equal a free cash flow yield of at least 15%. And usually these are numbers that you will find in the FANGs, uh, but not in many other industries as John hinted to. So I think that is the fundamental point. Um, but uh, I think the market is always looking ahead, say, okay, um, we know uh, this is probably going to sustain if gold keeps at 18, 1900, that's very solid margins. What's going to happen is um, uh, we see debt repayment, uh, we see um, uh, dividend hikes. But I think the, the, the real question, and I think this is where the experience from the last cycle kicks in, um, you know, are these management teams going to do the same stupid M&A deals and cope, totally burn their balance sheet as we've seen 10 years ago? And I think this is the ultimate fear because um, what the fundamental issue in the industry is, and I think it's widely overlooked now in that market is, um, your reserve lives when we were compared like eight years ago are coming down from, from 16 years to 10 years, which is a significant shrink. Uh, uh, um, your reserve grade is still hovering around one gram, so no progress. Your exploration expenditures on a global scale compared to 2010 is still down by 50%. Uh, and as a result, your reserve base is, has been shrinking by 40% more or less in 10 years. So now we have the situation where gold is trading at a record high in most currencies, uh, including the US dollar. But the question is, okay, it, it, it can be as good as it gets, but what are you going to do? Because you have to replenish somehow to what you take out of the ground. And um, it's easy to um, say, okay, we will not allow any big premium deals, but the market probably sees already, you probably will have to because after eight, nine years of cost cutting, firing your exploration teams, you will have to reinvest. And I think this is where the generalists and every investor should ask the right question. You know, the industry is not growing, it's shrinking from a production standpoint. And free, mar free cash flow margins are good, dividends are good, debt repayment is good, but ultimately what the investor wants to see is growth. And yep. right now there is no growth. So <laughs> I think the market um, is expecting an answer at which the companies have to answer rather sooner than later. And I think is, if this vacuum, um, uh, and we've seen really little M&A despite the rising gold price, if, if this vacuum of deals or transaction continues to persist, I think the, the question mark will just rise. So we think the market is really digesting of 
who has a real business model and not. And I think that compares to the last cycle where, you know, the tide lifted all the boats and then everything went up. <laughs> yeah. So I think quite different, yeah. But in a Fair. good way. Yeah. So do you, do you think MA is going to pick up or is it going to be more strategic and careful this time around where there will be MA in some pockets, but not in not across the board? Um, yeah, we think MA will. Um, it will be uh, more um, geographically driven, like we have seen with the deal with Endeavor in Taranga. So you want to create the, the new kid on the block in West Africa, so to speak. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that, that is a position that's hard to challenge from, from any other. So, and then we think same things are going to happen in West Australia, in the Red Lake District. But there is interesting movements uh, and what the sort of deals we see now is like really mergers among equals to become bigger. Uh, but the juniors at the mid caps have really not played into that equation yet. So I would expect that that is going to change uh, once the market has consolidated uh, where, you know, it doesn't make sense to move your market cap from 10 to 20 billion because everybody can buy a 10 billion market cap stock. It's big enough, it's liquid enough. Um, but uh, then I think it's going to, to drain down in terms of market cap scale, um, which we didn't see really yet this year. I mean, very few deals only. Yep. Okay, interesting. Angelos, could I turn to you um, and, and get a sense of how you think, firstly, the, the junior tier is performing? Um, and then also, um, you know, what do you ask of the companies that you hold um, with this sort of more positive cash flow environment? Um, are you asking them to um, reinvest this cash flow, pay back dividends, look at acquisitions, joint ventures, that kind of thing? Yes, uh, first of all, can I make a quick comment with regard to the journalist investor participating in the rally? Of course. And we've seen it in our history many times before that we always participate in the cyclical rallies of commodities. The question is what type of journalist investor participates? We don't expect the pension funds and the yield based uh, investors to participate in a cyclically, uh, cyclical, uh, you know, highly volatile market. But uh, there are lots of other generalist investors that are looking at the sector very carefully. And, and I think what happened is that market uh, sentiment changed very dramatically and very quickly in the last year and a half and caught uh, most generalists by surprise. Um, the first uh, leg of the bull market, of a new bull market, is typically powered by speculators and uh, se sector or specialist investors who understand the companies, they have been following them for years, they are very quick to mobilize capital and, and position for the next uh, uh, price development. Now we see a little bit of consolidation because of the market sentiment cooling a little bit or, or whatever, uh, gold uh, trading sideways. Uh, it is providing a good entry point for the certain generalist investor who is open-minded, so to speak, to a cyclical risk in relation to gold. And I feel that uh, with the next uh, leg of this uh, bull market unfolding, hopefully sometime next year, it will draw significant generalist money. Uh, and uh, we must not forget that uh, globally, the asset allocation to gold equities is way less than 1% of, of assets. So uh, a little bit of a change, it doesn't need to be much, even a 1% change of allocation in global capital uh, in preference of gold miners could have a huge impact on, on valuations and prices. Mm -hmm. um, now to, to turn to your question about the junior miners that we specialize in, uh, it is, uh, an interesting uh, point that uh, Florian made, uh, whether the mid caps, uh, the mid cap producers are going to engage in more M&A activity. Uh, and I think it is, uh, you know, absolutely uh, essential for them to do so because uh, the management teams are now pressed by the shareholders for, for, for growth. And, and what are they going to do with all this cash they are spinning out? Uh, they are not paying dividends. They are not likely to change their dividend policy very easily and very dramatically anytime soon. So their shareholders naturally are asking, what are you going to do with that cash? 
you have to mobilize it, you have to replenish your reserve, you have to replenish your, your growth pipeline. And given that uh, exploration nowadays can take uh, up to 15 years for a project from discovery to production, the only way out is to buy brownfield and, and uh, well-developed projects that have a, a fairly clear sideline to production. So I think it, you know, we have already had uh, uh, very smaller deals happen at the junior space uh, for the more prospective, the sort of the, the more developed uh, uh, deposits and projects. But I think this is likely to accelerate. In my mind, it is uh, you know, almost uh, a, you know, a sure thing that uh, we will see a wave of activity, a wave of corporate activity. And uh, some of these deals are conducted at significant premium unlike the sort of zero premium mergers of equals at the large caps uh, level, the juniors do enjoy significant premium. Uh, we have seen it uh, recently with uh, three or four transactions that uh, uh, concluded trans uh, corporate deals at uh, 50, 60% uh, premium. Yep, absolutely, excellent. It's um, an interesting time um, indeed to see where it's, uh, things are going to move. Um, I wanted to uh, come on to, um, as we're well into the time now, uh, some of the portfolio strategies that you're uh, applying or some, some of the investment approaches that, that you're applying given the prevailing market conditions that we've discussed. Um, and also, you know, if we're in a bull market now, how do you cut through the noise of, you know, presumably everyone's inundated with the next great asset that's coming in from Western Australia, for instance. Um, how do you cut through the noise and, and filter down a, a two watch list? And also has the backdrop of the lack of travel and the COVID-19 scenario slowed down the sort of deal flow um, as it were, or, or is it something that you can do very much desk based and then you can look to travel out to sites next year as well? Um, Angelos, uh, do, do you want to start with that? Sure. Well. In the junior space, uh, the COVID situation hasn't had a huge impact because they are in a more fortunate position of having smaller sites, uh, much smaller workforces, easier to contain, easier to regulate the flow of, uh, of people in and out. So they haven't suffered that bad. They have, they have obviously had to shut down at certain times when there were national lockdowns and activity, but uh, in many countries, um, the mining activity has been declared an essential service. And therefore, the miners have been able to continue operating as long as they had uh, a secure COVID pro protocol. So the, the smaller companies have been fortunate to uh, not have been impacted negatively uh, by the situation, uh, unless they were at the stage of preparing for a major financing uh, of a project where the financiers were not able to send due diligence teams to the site, to uh, uh, pre better better prepare for the credit committee decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So there have been sort of certain isolated incidents uh, of, of disruption. But uh, in terms of uh, our uh, criteria for positioning uh, in this uh, space, we think that uh, the so-called brownfield projects are going to be favored in a corporate activity, in any corporate activity, because uh, of the need to replace this lost uh, reserve and the, 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 you know, replenish the growth pipeline. So companies will prefer advanced projects that have uh, significant results, that have some uh, economic feasibility study, that are ready to progress to, to production in a fairly quick time frame, And uh, they can benefit from a substantial influx of capital from a bigger company to help things along and move the, and accelerate the sideline. So other than that, uh, as always, uh, the management team is paramount. Uh, you have to be uh, comfortable with the ability of the team to execute, to deliver a project, as well as to conclude an attractive deal with uh, an incoming vendor, an incoming, uh, you know, family or, or uh, acquirer. And, uh, and, and uh, let's not forget the, the quality of the rock, you know, the, the, the resource and the economic viability of the resource and the profitability of the prospective mine is paramount so that it has uh, the robustness uh, of, uh, to withstand the volatility in uh, uh, metal prices as well as attract uh, the interest of uh, larger companies. 
Yep. Just on that point of the quality of the rock or the deposit, um, we know that exploration is harder to sort of get the next best sort of tier one asset. Um, do you think that, that, that generally, that, you know, that's, it, there, there are fewer out there, there are fewer quality um, deposits out there that people are discovering now. So it's changing the way that you, that that's what's leading to this sort of more brown field um, strategy that you, you mentioned. Absolutely, absolutely. As Florian uh, mentioned earlier, exploration expenditure is way less than 50% of what it was uh, some 10 years ago. And uh, it, it, they ha we have not identified uh, significant uh, discoveries um, for the last you know, five, six years. Um, the, 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 the whole sector has been uh, clamping down on expenditure during the, the years of severe bear market up to 20, late 2018, early 2019. And uh, they, they focused on cutting costs, uh, maintaining you know, profitability, paying down debt. So exploration was the last thing on the mind and every marginal project was put on the shelf. So now it is becoming a little bit more attractive we have seen some uh, exploration activity. The junior companies have raised a lot of capital in the last couple of uh, months. Uh, the last six months, I would say, there, were, there was a huge flurry of uh, private placings. So a lot of capital infusion in the junior sector that has uh, enabled them to accelerate exploration drilling. But we all know that uh, the results from exploration are very difficult to produce and anal analyze and interpret and uh, arrive to an economic feasibility study that is financeable to, to, uh, you know, to develop a project. So these are long lead items and uh, they're not gonna produce results very easy and very quickly. Yep, certainly. Um, okay, Ian, can I come to you and uh, get your, the charterous view on um, how you're investing in this bull market? Um, you know, is this the time to be buying mid-tier and majors or you know, what's your criteria at this point? We, we already own, most of our fund is already in the mid-tier sector. Yeah. And it's uh, still 50-50 it's split between gold and silver. So we think that, I agree with Angela, I think there's going to be a feeding frenzy of m and if, if the gold price holds here or even moves higher than the silver price, um, and take the previous point that Flora made about uh, these companies not generating too much uh, organic growth because uh, the life of the mines is starting to shrink. Um, takeovers is, is, is really the only other route going. And if the price of the other side of the coin is if gold and silver production starts to drop a bit, um, all other things being equal, the price will go up. So the mines that have got decent production are going to become even more profitable and become even more attractive takeover targets for, um, for the bigger companies that maybe aren't in the same boat. So I can see a huge amount of lemonade. There's, there's, there's loads of companies uh, in, in the space, in the mid-tier space. Um, and, uh, you know, potentially any one of them is a takeover target by a bigger company. Um, so we're in the mid-tier space. We think that's a sweet spot uh, to be in. And we also favor a, a really heavy weight of silver over gold because we think silver's got a lot more upside than gold. And, um... Well, there are fewer silver mining companies, though, than gold mining companies. Do you think that that chain restricts the, you know, the options as an investor to sort of exploit that that weighting? Um, well, it's really uh, an argument, really, for buying a fund rather than trying to buy them individually, um, because uh, um, it is a restricted space. Um, and a lot of silver gets mined as a byproduct of lead and zinc anyway. So the amount of silver mark, silver that comes onto the market that comes out of pure silver mines, there aren't that many companies. But there's still enough to uh, throw the investments on. And, uh, you know, they are, you know, potentially very attractive if the silver price goes up. And if you get big demand coming through for silver, um, without any particularly big move in lead or zinc prices, um, the, the, the lead and zinc miners aren't going to ramp up their production to meet the increased demand. So you can find an increase in the demand for silver has a quite disproportionate effect on the price uh, because, because of this uh, anomaly where most silver doesn't come from silver miners. Yep. 
Do you think that um, with potential energy policy switch in the US, Biden's tenure, um, silver could, you know, the industrial qualities of silver in renewables, photovoltaics, do you think that's got some scope to grow and that will actually take a larger uh, demand? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, Biden's talking about, you know, installing solar panels from, from coast to coast. I mean, they, they could, you know, they could go uh, manic on this. Um, and you can't build solar panels without silver panels. So, you know, it's very easy to identify where the demand for silver is going to come from. It's not quite so easy to uh, identify um, where all the supplies are going to come from to meet the extra demand. So, um, yeah. so that's, 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 why we, that's why we prefer silver to gold, really. Right. Interesting. Great. Um, John, can I come back to you about your uh, portfolio strategy uh, at this time in the market? Are you very much um, seeing value in the junior tier at the moment? Hmm. So <clears throat> as a fund, we have a value bias, um, but I wouldn't say that that is the key criteria, but it is, it is a fairly important one. Um, so yeah, in terms of valuations, definitely the Mid caps, smaller caps are much, much, much better value than the large caps. Um, but in saying that, I think the way we're positioning the fund, um, I guess without speaking our school, I think of uh, when I run the fund, I run it not knowing what the gold price is, not knowing what the silver price is. I said, I don't know tomorrow, I know what's today. And so I plan the portfolio in such a way that if things go well and gold price continues to go well, I'll have a big elements of my portfolio that would benefit from that. Uh, but the converse is true. If let's say gold prices just tank, um, I would plan my portfolio so that we wouldn't go down like a stone. Okay, so that, that's really the way I kind of think of the portfolio. A bit like a football team, you don't have all the strikers and no defense, no goalkeeper, right? In case, yeah. you know, somebody attacks and then you've got nobody at the back. So you've got to have a bit of both. And that's how I kind of think of it from our point of view. Well, what would be those more defensive uh, holdings then? What, what are the characteristics? Is it someone that's got, you know, no debt? Uh, sort of yeah, pretty much. So the defen a defensive characteristic will be, you know, uh, net cash, uh, very low cost producers, very high margin. So your margin compression isn't that great. Whereas the high cost guys, you know, a $200 moving goal could half their profits, you know, but a very low cost guy could stay there for, you know, take a $500 fall and they'll be fine. Now, that, that's, that's, the, um, that, that's the defensive type stock, if you like. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Florian, could I come to you? Are you, are you similarly um, seeing value in the juniors? Um, and that's where uh, perhaps the investments can be made now. Yeah, so we have a value bias, definitely, um, so um, which we find it's more appealing in the mid cap or in the junior space. Um, but um, I think that the, the real problem is like uh, multidimensional for these small companies. First of all, with COVID, um, obviously, you can't travel. I mean, the, the, the good quality guys in the industry who would like to perform transactions are pr just probably not able to do so because you can't travel there is no site visits we have been restricted now for probably seven months to go uh, to any site um, so uh, all those things have been on hold uh, and then you have um, a sh i think the shrinking geographical focus um, uh, where you know the world is more unsafe today than it was before um, we have a constitutional reform in Chile, there is the jihadist in, uh, in West Africa, there is hiccups in the PNG. I mean, there are problems all over the place. So I think in the end of the day, where we want to invest is um, in, in, to, in to proven teams, mind builders who've done it before, um, uh, which can do a creative deals, but which always have a cornerstone asset, which they can, uh, which they can develop. And uh, this is really difficult to find. And I think now what we see with gold running to 18, 1900s, you know, everybody gets, uh, gets a deal done. So I think there is good money chasing a lot of bad deals. And I think that's a recipe for failure to some degree, 
and we don't want to be part of that, to be honest. So, but we like the, the mid caps for several reasons. First of all, um, it's 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 easier to grow a two three hundred thousand ounce producer by 10 percent for the next five years uh, compared to like a five million ounce um, uh, gorilla, uh, which is very tough to feed all the time because um, you have to um, deploy so much uh, cash. Um, and then it's really like jurisdiction. Um, so I think this is not the time to go for super um, cheap things. You know, things are cheap for a reason, but why would you take um, additional geopolitical risk? Um, uh, and you probably pay the lowest possible price, but there is probably a lot really small chance to build the project in the next uh, few years. So this is where we think, okay, things are expensive or less expensive, but we would have to tie chest into what we, what we do. So um, I think our focus is, is, is always on people, on teams, on the right jurisdictions um, and uh, on, on scalability. Um, as a good, solid cost profile um, and basically a cornerstone asset that is somehow overlooked in the market. So um, for us, it's always interesting. Why would, let's say, company XYZ um, in Canada trade at uh, $30 per reserve ounce when, you know, two years ago, M&A transactions were done, let's say, at 200 or whatever. Sorry for that. That's a little bit annoying. Um, but these are the things um, on a relative basis that uh, we try to uh, uh, digest. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. Um, okay, we've got about just under 10 minutes left. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come through on email and also on the, um, the Q&A here. Um, one of them is, how does the panel see companies being able to secure future funding of early stage exploration, which is the R&D of the mining industry and critical for, for its sustainability? And I think um, this is pertaining to greenfield exploration um, rather than brownfield um, and obviously we've touched on it before um angelos i know you covered uh, a fair bit on uh, the attractiveness of brownfield and the risk side but perhaps i'll rephrase the question to the group is now probably the best time for new greenfield exploration projects to come in and raise capital well uh, it is always uh, dependent on the evolution of this bull market uh, in the last uh, two uh, I would say uh, four to six months, uh, correcting myself, uh, we, we saw a massive window of opportunity to finance uh, junior companies. And we have seen many very early stage exploration uh, companies raising you know, surprisingly large amounts of capital. So mm -hmm. you know, even at the <coughs> early stage of the bull market cycle, uh, greenfield exploration still attracts attention of a certain type of investor who is more speculative, who believes that, uh, you know, with uh, successful drilling results, they will get a two or three or ten bagger. Uh, so you, you still get that type of investor participating in the early stages. Uh, but, you know, this is also the type of investor that if we see a setback in the market, will be the first to get out of the door and, and prices could tank, you know, like a rock. So again, you know, it's a very fickle game and very dangerous game to play at the early stage of, the, of this uh, cycle. If, if we have sustainably higher gold prices, I'm sure that, you know, most uh, projects that were previously considered marginal or an economic will come out, of, uh, come out of the drawer and be dusted off and presented to as amazing opportunities to investors. And it, is, it, is, it has been interesting to me, actually, over the last nine months, how the conversation among most investors has changed from the deep value, fundamental investing in gold mining companies to the marginality of projects. I, are, we, are we likely to get a better return by investing in a project that has a marginal profitability of $1,500 an ounce? rather than investing in a company with, who operates at $600 an ounce uh, marginal cost. So obviously, if gold uh, goes, maintains the, its price at 2000 the $1,500 an ounce marginal producer gets a, a much bigger percentage gain in the profitability of the project and therefore could have a more significant re-rating. 
but uh, of course the converse happens if the gold price has a setback. So, you know, it, it's a sure way to make money, but also to lose money if you don't get the cycle right. Yep, absolutely. Um, John, can I, do, do you like expiration? We didn't really touch, sorry, within your portfolio, how early stage um, is that of interest to, uh, to you, the, Greek, the greenfield expiration? Um, so we do have a lot of explorers in the portfolio. Um, for me, it's all about position sizing, but I would look at anything. So when I say anything, uh, say market cap of 10 mil or something like that. Okay, so that would be, yeah. So I look at anything. But um, in terms of greenfield, uh, so I don't have a technical background. So some of my peer group may be geologists, mining engineers. I have a finance background. So I, I find greenfields personally a bit harder because I, I just don't have that background. So I personally tend not to play many in greenfields. Uh, brownfields for sure, uh, or, or just, you know, um, as long as they're post-discovery. So pre-discovery, I think I, I would bulk because I just don't know anything. Okay, so I kind of feel, why play to my weakness? Uh, there are lots of other um, gold funds where they got lots of great technical bench and they, they should be the guys to, to look at those. So that's just how I look at it. But I would look at exploration. I think you should have them in your portfolio. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. That's good. Um, I've had another question here on the silver price. Um, what about silver? Um, I think this came in, in when you were talking about it. Uh, do you see $30 or more uh, by May 2021? Ian, do you want to uh, give a prediction or just perhaps a thought on on silver? Um, it's got a long, lot further to run. Um, yeah, but you have to uh, look at the uh, really extreme volatility of silver when it does start to run. I mean, um, a couple of months ago, it went from nineteen dollars to thirty dollars in, in in a few days. Um, so, it, although it's stuck at twenty four dollars at the moment. Um, and $36, say, seems a long way away. Um, given the way it trades, it's possible. Uh, it's not necessarily a prediction, but it's possible that it can get there in a couple of weeks. I mean, that's just, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, when it goes up, it goes up much quicker than virtually any of the other metals. So um, what would be surprising with silver is you did have an up move. It wasn't of that nature, because that would be out of character. So, and also, um, when these metals peaked in 2011, uh, gold peaked at $1,960 or something, silver peaked at just under $50. So silver is half what it was in uh, 2011, where gold is, is, is up and, and, and uh, at that high level. Um, so in relative terms, silver is still very cheap relative to gold. That's what I covered earlier on. Copper is cheap relative to gold. Oil is cheap relative to gold. Every, all the other commodities are cheap relative to gold because gold has first mover status in this commodity bull market. Gold is the one investors rush to when they see um, currency debasement. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, on a long-term view, copper is just as inflationary proof as gold or silver is. So we just keep repeating the same thing. The, the silver and copper um, potentially have a lot more upside than gold at the moment. It's catching up. They, they, you know, they've got some catching up to do. So, yes, I could easily see that. And it, it can happen very, very quickly as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be drawn out over months. It can happen in, in, inside a few days. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. That's wonderful. Well, look, um, that takes us right on to the hour mark. Um, gentlemen, thanks very much for that excellent discussion. We've covered a lot of ground, and it does seem, despite the many, many risks and the multitude of things that we've got to look out for now investing in this space, that there is um, a lot of positivity and, and a lot of bandwidth um, for these precious metals uh, to run in. So thank you very much to Ian, Angelos, John and Florian. And thanks very much for everyone else to tuning in.